How's everybody feeling this morning? Let me hear where you're at. You coming feeling? Whew. I just want to give you some props, 930. Like last week, the 1115 didn't even have half of what you brought to the 930. I don't know what it is about people. I don't want to diss them. God bless them. They're part of our family. But I wish some of y'all could just show up a little later and help them out. It's, come on. It's going to be such a good morning in church. And uh, our birthday is obviously a part of that. But here's, here's really the reason why. We serve a God who can do something in a moment that can change your life. Come on. I want to celebrate at the start of this message our second birthday. I want to celebrate, and some of y'all won't know this, you weren't around, but I want to celebrate that two years ago on this Sunday, we were sent out from Christian Life Assembly. We had a team of 63 people that signed up and said, we're on the dream team. We'll serve. We're all in. In fact, some of you will remember eating churros at our first launch gathering over at Terry Fox out in the lobby of Terry Fox. I looked, we had this whole band up here today and I looked and I'm like, only these two remember the churros. Everybody else was after the churros. It's kind of fun to think back to that, right? Like, I mean, I remember a Sunday before we launched, Pastor, or not a Sunday, uh, a, a day before we launched, Pastor Troy and I, and he wasn't Pastor Troy at that time. I mean, he was in his heart with the gift and anointing, but he was just volunteering at our church as what we called our launch coordinator. I gave him a title because I wanted to ask him to do a whole lot of stuff, and it's just like, you know, <laughs> come on, you were already a pastor in the house. And uh, so there we were, we're sitting, <laughs> we're sitting in Starbucks, and you remember this, I didn't, we didn't talk about this before, but we, we looked at one another, we're like, we don't have enough musicians to form a worship band for this thing. Like, how are we going to get through week number one? And we're like, who's going to go to the Bible college and ask if anyone plays music? And who's going to go to Long and McQuaid and be like, like, did you ever go to church in your life at any point? And he's going to the, you know what I mean? And we were like, listen, you don't even have to want to be a part of our church long term, but could you give us a couple of weeks? Come on, because someone's going to show up on launch Sunday who does want to be a part of what God's called us to do, who's going to get bought into a vision. Jordy and Beck on our launch Sunday. Come on, Beck, the director of our worship team, walked in on launch Sunday, and we didn't know the miracle that was walking in. And so many of you guys, I just wish I could celebrate just all day what God has done. One more funny story from the launch. I remember... Uh, I don't know, Alana, if she's here for this service or she's not here. Anyway, so Alana McClellan, she was on our launch team. And we were sitting together a few weeks before launch, and I turned to Alana, and I said, Alana, do you want to be on worship team? And she's like, I totally, if you know Alana, she like flipped out. She's like, I totally want to be on worship team, and I can't sing, but I will do it. We're like, that's all we need is someone with their arms up at this point, right? Come on. Thank God she leads the cafe now in Jesus. She'll sing for you. Or maybe not. She'll raise her hands at the cafe. We celebrate all that God has done. We don't celebrate that we're something. Honestly, I love our church. I think this is a great church. But we don't celebrate that this is a great church. We celebrate we have a great God. And we celebrate that it's his name and it's his power. Because none of us, we can create an atmosphere and we can put up balloons, but nothing can change a life except for the presence and power of God. I want to celebrate. I mean, I wanna, you know what? Last week is so cool, too. Just right before our birthday, record attendance across our two services. Come on, let's give God praise for what he's doing. But more than we celebrate big numbers and, you know, I'm all, it, that matters because we've got a city to reach, uh, thousands of people to see. Their lives change, but we celebrate stories, and we love people, and it's on an individual level where God always advances his kingdom. And so I want to celebrate this morning uh, that on June 18th, 2017, just a few months after we'd started the church, my friend Dalton, who's uh, going to be in our next service, he was in that service, and he raised his hand that morning to say, I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. And I asked him asked him recently, I said, hey, can I share that story on our birthday? So can we, we just remember that it's God advances his kingdom person by person, heart by heart, reaching into our lives. And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I, he sent me back this text message. I wanted to read it to you. This is so, so good. He said, I still remember that message speaking to me and something shifting in my perception. Listen to this. Before coming to Resonate, I was very much atheist believing there was no higher power. So much has changed since I raised my hand and chose to believe my whole world has improved. I see now it was all God's doing from the beginning. I'd still be searching for purpose in my life if not for God bringing me closer to him 
it amazes me to see God's plan unfold right in front of me. Can we just celebrate this morning, atheist to amazed by God? Come on, on our second birthday, what God has done. Let's stand to our feet. God, we give you this praise. God, this is, this is for you. We bless you. Come on, church. Let's bless God. Give him your best praise. God, thank you for what you've done in me. Thank you for what you've done in others. And thank you that we, because we serve a God who is from everlasting to everlasting, the best is yet to come. We've never been as close as we're going to be in this year in your presence. We've never walked with as much of the fullness of your spirit as we're going to in year number three. And God, you're going to lead us from here into eternity face to face with Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for the thousands of lives that are yet to be changed. And thank you, God, for the faith that's inside of us that you call, that we get to do this and you're going to use us in Jesus' name. Everybody say one more time. Come on, amen, amen, amen. You can grab your seat this morning. You can take a seat as we go to God's Word. We are in week number two of a message series out of the book of Philippians. And we're just going one chapter a week for four weeks through this great book. Last week we dove in. We actually kind of laid the groundwork for the series. What's the context? Why is Paul writing to this church that he started some 10, 12 years before he writes this letter, and what is he trying to do with this letter? And we said last week that actually what Paul was trying to do is he's trying to actually mature this church that's already established. And I find it so interesting that how God wants to mature this church is God wants to put more joy into these people. Because sometimes when we think about spiritual maturity, and these are important things and these are good things, and Paul prays these things for the churches he leads, we think about wisdom, we think about knowledge, we think about we think about these things when we think spiritual maturity, but how many times are we thinking about constant joy as a reflection of spiritual maturity? And so we see last week in the verse that we read as what we said is the theme text for this letter, in fact, for the series. It was this from chapter 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. So there's this measure of spiritual maturity that is how much joy is our life reflecting on a regular basis. And because Paul knows that you and I are going to be like seriously all the time. He's like, I'm going to know I'm going to need to see this, say this again. Come on, I'm going to say it one more time. Rejoice. Joy as a measure and a reflection of our spiritual maturity. And what's ironic about this letter, and we said this last week, was that Paul is writing this letter on constant joy, not from a mountaintop spiritual experience. He didn't just come back from some kind of youth retreat where he got high on God and had a whole lot of time with a bunch of people that he loved. No, he's writing this out of a place of isolation in a Roman prison awaiting likely execution. And he's writing to mature us. Now, in chapter 2, where we're going to go today, Paul makes a little bit of an abrupt turn in this second section of the letter. And suddenly, out of talking just about pure joy and what God is doing and, and who he is, <coughs> Paul starts talking about the attitude that we are to bring to this place, to God's house, to this body of believers as we serve one another. Paul wants to go after our attitudes and our motivations. Sometimes in his letters, Paul writes about theology. He writes about um, who God is. And sometimes he writes about our vertical relationship with God. How are we to worship? And what should this relationship with God look like? But then in sections like this, chapter 2 of Philippians, he's talking about these horizontal relationships. What's shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm? How do we serve one another? And what's the attitude that we serve one another with? And so he starts here in verse number 1 of Philippians chapter 2, and he says, he says this in the lead into this second section. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, <coughs> then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Paul starts off in this potent verse, verse to this new section, and he says there's some things that we need to be receiving from God before we can have a right attitude in relationship with one another. And I want to go through a few of these things he points out to us. The first thing he says that we're going to need to have from God if we're going to live a life beyond ourselves is we need to be receiving encouragement from God. And I just love this about our God. 
that we don't just serve. And sometimes our perspective is that we serve a God and he just always wants you to grow. And he's always telling you how to grow. I'm so thankful that we serve a God who wants me to grow, but also celebrates when I do grow. Come on, somebody. He doesn't just tell you the life he wants you to leave behind. He celebrates you as you walk away from it. He doesn't just tell you, come on, take a step further in your faith and in your disciplines and in your passion and your pursuit and in your joy. No, he encourages, come on, son, I saw that step that you took. Come on, girl, I'm watching you as you grow and I'm celebrating it. And Paul's like, if we're going to have a right attitude, you better be soaking in the encouragement of our God. Secondly, he says that we need this if we're going to live beyond ourselves, that we're going to need some comfort from the love of God. This is so important, because how many have ever seen a crusty Christian? Yeah, you don't need to raise your hand or point. But it's like some of them, they're trying to serve somebody beside them, and they're just like, they are the crustiest, they're just mad at the world. And Paul, no, you better, this is that whole, I just spent some time this week in Florida. I'm sorry, I did, you know, and I was with a coaching group that many of you know that I'm a part of, about 110 pastors, and we've... Uh, all started churches uh, in the last 10 years or so. And we're learning from uh, uh, Pastor Matt Keller as he's pulled this group together. We get together, we encourage one another, spend a couple days just praying a lot for one another, kind of learning from one another. And so it was great. And there was also uh, a, a little bit of beach in there as well. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Now, when, when I got on the plane for the red eye last Sunday night, <coughs> you don't really want to listen to the safety announcement but this is so important when they say that whole part about if there is a change in cabin pressure, what do you need to do? You need to put on your oxygen mask first before you try and put on the oxygen mask of that person next. It's exactly what Paul is saying. It's like, don't try and serve somebody else with the love of God if you're not sucking it in yourself because you will just be dead. You won't be giving them, you'll be no good to them if you aren't breathing in the comfort of God's love. I'm about to tell you, church, this is Paul speaking, you know, how you can serve one another with a right attitude. But before you try and have that right attitude, come on, put on that oxygen mask. Start breathing in the love of God. Come on, get some comfort in your soul. He goes on, he says, if I'm going to live for more than myself, I better be more than myself. I need, the, I need fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, we don't just serve a God who wants to just soak you in his love. He wants to give you some power. He wants to fill you with supernatural power so you can live beyond yourself. He goes on, he says, tenderness and compassion. He lists these things that we need to be receiving from God. And there's one word that stands out to me of this potent first verse, of this new section. And it's, it's the second word when Paul says, therefore, if you have encouragement and comfort and love and, and you've got the Holy Spirit, if. When Paul says if, he is implying that it is possible that there are people within this Philippian church that have not been receiving these things from God. It's possible to go to church for 10 years. It's possible to be in an exciting church like this church in Philippi that the Apostle Paul planted. He's about to send Timothy to go and do ministry. It's a happening place. It's an exciting place. And it is possible to sit in an atmosphere where God is moving and to completely miss it. It's the same today, isn't it? It's possible that maybe you're here this morning and you came in and you sat next to someone who's been receiving all these things from God. They've just been soaking in God's encouragement and his comfort and his love. And you walked in this morning and they were like, hey! And they're about to dive all into worship and they're about to go serve somebody with a right attitude. And you're standing there and you're saying, I've been in this same building and you've listened to the same messages, but it feels like you've missed it. And I think a lot of us have felt this way before. We felt like it's for somebody else to be living that dialed in for God. It's for somebody else to have that encouragement and that comfort and God's love. Paul says it's so true that you can be in a church that he planted and Timothy is going to pastor. And you've still missed out on receiving these things from God. Can I just speak to somebody today? You don't need to be an orphan in God's house. You don't need to think or believe or have to walk out somebody else receiving from God what you feel like you're standing just outside of. Today you are, I don't, I'm like, I don't know, Pentecostal up in here. So I just like, <laughs> we're about to open the altars. 
hurts. Maybe it's even because you haven't wanted to step into it. Maybe it's not because you feel like I've been trying to, but I've been missing it. But maybe you've just actually chosen to stay on the outside of what God is doing. And today God is saying, no, you don't have to be an outsider anymore. Now I've got some encouragement and I've got some comfort and I've got some love and I've got some Holy Spirit and some tenderness and compassion. And don't you dare go try and serve the world without having first received these things. Well, from here, Paul's going to abruptly change, and he's going to start to challenge us quite directly on the attitudes that we ought to have when we come into this place and we serve one another. How many are ready for an attitude adjustment to start year number three? I'm in. I'm in. I am. And I'm not talking about the attitude adjustment that's just on your face. You ever had an attitude adjustment that just hits your face, but your heart's just, like, not there at all? Yeah. No, I don't mean that one. <laughs> I mean an attitude adjustment beneath the surface. You've got something from God going on in your life. Well, what's the attitude adjustment Paul calls us to? He says this again in verse number two as we read this already. He said, make my joy complete. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. So what's the first attitude adjustment we need? Well, number one, if I'm going to live for more than myself, what do we need? We need a spirit of unity in God's house. A while ago, Rachel and I, we had family over, some sort of family gathering. I think it was a birthday party or something. And there was a whole bunch of kids. And the kids were doing what kids do when they get together and they start to play. They were writing with crayons on the wall. They were putting stickers on things. You know the stickers that take them like two seconds to put a sticker down? It's take you 20 minutes to get that same sticker off. The kind that we have thousands of in our home for some reason. Anyways, so the kids are putting stickers all over everything. And we're like, listen, if the attitudes are, uh, attitudes, if the adults are going to be able to... <laughs> If the adults are going to be able to have a conversation, we just we need like Netflix to help us out. And so we took all the kids over into the living room. We sat them down on the couch and we said, okay, kids, we're going to watch something. But then I made like this rookie mistake. I said, now we're all going to need to agree on what we watch together. And the kids, are just, Merdell is just like, no. <laughs> I suggested some sort of program that had to do with teaching kids the alphabet. And one of the older kids was like, boring. <laughs> It was like they made it their pride and joy to make sure that none of them agreed on a show. As soon as I wanted them to agree on something, it was like, I might even like that show that you're suggesting, but I'm going to pick a different one. And thank you, Netflix, for laying them all out on the screen for them to see in advance so they could pick their own show. <laughs> this is church sometimes. When we roll in here, and we've got our own thoughts, and that's, God's not calling us to uniformity, but... We roll in here and we've got our preferences and our preferences seem to matter more than purpose. And we start holding on to those things instead of loosely coming. Here's what happens when we made a decision to follow Jesus. When we make a decision to go all in after Jesus, that was a decision for me to lay aside my opinion and take on Jesus's. Come on, when we went all in for Jesus, that was a decision for me to lay aside my agenda and take on his agenda. When we went all in for Jesus, that was a choice to walk into this place and not just love and hang out with the people that look and act like me, but to actually love everybody in this house. I'm grateful that we serve a God that will not let you love him and not love the people around you. You think I'm making that up? No, God did not just call you to a vertical relationship with him. In fact, he says it's impossible for you to have that if you don't have love for one another. I mean, you, th you think I'm making this up. James, John went so hard on this. In 1 John chapter 4, he says, listen, if any of you in the church, if you want to say, I love God, but you hate your neighbor, you are a liar. Whew. <laughs> are you sure, John? I mean, grace through faith. John's like, listen, if, you th if you're telling me that you have this relationship going on and it's not impacting these relationships, I'm going to tell you something, you're a liar. Whoo, whoo, whoo. Year number three, Resonate Church, pastor talking about being a liar from the platform trying to encourage us to better our attitudes. Come on, somebody. The Bible will even go further than that elsewhere and say, listen, if you don't love your enemies, you don't even have this intact. And so I'm thankful that we get to come into this place and look around and not just love the people that look like us and not just love the people that think like us. No, come on, somebody. Turn to the person next to you and choose your wife or your husband if you're sitting next to them and say, I love you. And man, we've got so much in common. Come on, somebody. Common faith, common grace, one in mission and in vision and in spirit. Come on.
God's not called us to uniformity, but my opinion is, is gone. My agenda is gone, not for the agenda and opinion of a church, but for God's opinion and God's agenda and God's mission. That's what unity looks like in the house of God. I think Paul is wanting this church to raise its level of effectiveness. And so he says, listen, you need to be, first of all, receiving some things, but then turn and look at the world around you and you serve one another with a spirit of unity. Number two, he's going to tell us there's some more attitude adjustment that needs to happen in, chap- in verse number three, he goes on, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Second attitude adjustment. Paul is wanting to call out in this church <coughs> and now in us. is He's wanting to call out a selfless attitude. And this is like, this one is, this is so hard. I will, uh, this is hard for me, right? Like, I'll go to a birthday party, and it's like the one day a year it should be all about that other person. And I'm like, did I get to sit close enough? Like, I'm not really close enough. I should, I, be, I should be sitting closer to them. Come on, someone will be opening their present. And you're not just celebrating them. You're like, did you like it? Did you like, I don't know if they like it. Did you see their eyes? I'm not sure. Like, it's, I, even at a birthday, you're making it all about you it's like the one, come on. And it's not just us, right? The disciples of Jesus, they wrestled with this and struggled with this. In Luke chapter 22, they had this conversation. Who is going to be the greatest? Do we realize how crazy this is? Come on, guys. Out of the billions of people that have walked the planet, disciples, I mean, i got to call out the disciples, Guys, billions, billions of people have walked the planet. And you were the 12 that got to walk alongside Jesus and do life with him. Of everyone who's ever walked the planet, if there should have ever been a group of people that said, I can't believe we get to do this, it was these guys. And what are they saying? I'd like an upgrade on my position. It wasn't just the disciples. It was their moms. Matthew's gospel, Matthew tells us that the mom of James and John went to Jesus and was like, hey, Jesus, when you go come into your kingdom, would it be possible if my boys would be able to sit on your left? And on your, imagine if your mom went to your boss and was like, hey, <laughs> my son needs a raise. You know, you know what you do. James and, I, James and John, were, they were like rolling their eyes. Mom, seriously. <laughs> But we do this. Our agenda first. We put what we want ahead of other people. I'm so thankful this morning that in the two years of our church that there has been a group of people, our dream team, that has consistently showed up and said, we're going to do this with a selfless attitude. In fact, I want to celebrate this morning our Our Kids team. I don't know if you saw it or not, but this morning, yeah. This morning... They were in, I watched people at 6.30 a.m. carrying in shrink-wrapped carpet that they opened up, and the carpet still curled up because it's just so fresh, and set up a brand new kids' area. Come on, your kids have windows now. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Someone was saying to me this morning before the service, they're like, we dropped off our kids, and there was no tears this morning. I'm like, all they needed was a window. Come on. We got them some windows and a secure area totally blocked off. And, just, and, and it's just an amazing area. And what you might not have seen, and even just the little pictures of who's serving your kids today, I don't, can't even, that's just so fresh, covering up some sort of board that's talking about what's going on at the school so they could tell you who's serving your kid today. Come on, they just went all in. And it's not for them, it's not just as much as like, how can we just take care of kids? No, they want to create an atmosphere, an environment where these kids get pumped up to hear about and know and discover the love of God in their lives. I'm thankful for what you can see, but I'm really thankful for even the stuff that we can't see and the selflessness of that team. Even I've heard recently from Pastor Troy uh, that 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 team has put together not just a, a team that sings songs to the kids, but now we've got an actual kids 
worship team with actual worshipers. So rather than just having a teacher and giving any teacher a mic, we're like, who's the one that we need to give this Justin Bieber mic to that actually can sing and has a gift on their life and loves kids and knows how to dance? And come on, because we're just so passionate about creating this environment that's selfless. I don't know what they're getting from it when they're serving your 11-year-old boy. But come on, somebody, there's a selfless spirit to the team. That's what we were talking about away, when we were away in Florida. It was just like one of, the, one of the themes we were talking about was like, nobody in church wants to lead the 11-year-old boy. Come on, there are people in this church with your 11-year-old boy. Selfless. So where does this land us? So Paul starts out, he tells us, listen, you better be breathing something in. Something better be happening in this vertical relationship of encouragement and comfort and love and the spirit and tenderness and compassion. When all that is flowing, he's going to go ahead and adjust our attitudes. And we don't have time this morning to actually press into all the attitudes that Paul calls for us to change. He goes on in verse 14. He's going to say things like, do all things without grumbling or disputing. But where I want to go now as we close this message is where does it all lead to? In verses Starting in verse 6, Paul tells us it leads to a place of Christ-likeness. He says that this attitude that I'm calling out in you, church, this attitude, the reason I'm calling it out in you is because this is how Jesus served you when he came on a rescue mission for your soul. Because he, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing for you. Taking on the very nature of a servant for you. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself for you, became obedient to death, even death on a cross for you. It leads us to this place of Christ likeness. And then, and then ultimately, Paul goes on in verse 17 and he says this He says, Even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, even if, even, Paul's like, worst case scenario in the way that we serve one another and how I serve you, church, even if. And here, what's the sacrificial drink offering he's talking about? Here's the context. In the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Law, when somebody would bring a sacrifice, whether it was a burnt offering or a, an animal sacrifice or, or grain offering, when they bring any of these offerings before God and they would put them on the altar and, and then they would, of course, burn these offerings that they would be consumed and offered as an Roma before God as a sacrifice for sin. As they would do this, they would also pour a drink offering on top of it. And of course, because the altar is lit and, and then that drink offering would get poured out, it would immediately evaporate. It would just become a quick smoke and be gone. And Paul says, the way I'm serving you, church, worst case scenario is I pour out my whole life and nobody remembers it. I give everything I have and it's just a mere puff of smoke and it's gone and 30 years from now nobody remembers my name and of course that's not what happened we're here looking at what Paul's life did and how it impacted their lives and now our lives so that's not what happened but Paul was like here's the thing church even if that's what was to happen to my sacrifice for you what does he say he says I am glad now bring it full circle to the context of the letter and I rejoice I get joy from my life just being poured out for you, I rejoice how? With all of you. What's Paul saying? He's saying if 30 years from now, nobody remembers what I did, I won't be disappointed that I'm not remembered. I'm going to remember what I saw God do in you. And that is my joy. My joy is not somebody remembering that we were a part of this thing in the early days and we were there when there were churros and we were there on the second birthday. My joy 30 years from now won't be whether somebody remembers that I got to have a part in this and hold a microphone. My joy is going to be able to step back and see what God has done in your life. My joy is going to be able to step back and say, oh, Jamala stepped it up in, in leading our kids, and she had vision that went to the next level. Come on, there's joy in watching what God does in somebody else. Jess in the front row, as you send me emails and say, hey, I want to take on more leadership in our church. It's just like my joy. I get to watch. I get, I, my joy will not be what God, uh, God uh, people remembering me. My joy will be that I got a front row seat to what God was doing in other people. 
then this is, this is how they thought in the early church. Third John, John writes this. He says, I've got no greater joy than to hear that my children, so my spiritual kids, those of you that I have an opportunity to serve with my life are walking in the truth. I just, I just don't have any greater joy than that. Paul's sitting in a Roman prison awaiting execution. He says, listen, I don't care if anybody remembers me, but I do care that your life continues to grow because so much joy in my heart comes from what God is doing in you. So you might be sitting here today and you're like, wow, pastor. Like, I'm a long way from that. I'm that person that you were talking about early on. And, and I've just been in this atmosphere, but I don't feel like I'm really in it. I feel like I'm a little bit outside and today I really believe that you are one moment in God's presence away from a heart shift. It's not about resonating church. We're not trying to build a church. Come on, we're, we are trying to build people. We are trying to build people. We are trying to see a city reached and a city changed. Actually, we're not just trying to do that. We've been called by God to it, equipped for it, and are ready to do it in year number three. Maybe you're here this morning and you have been receiving those things from God. You would say, yeah, I've got his encouragement, his comfort, his love, the spirit, his tenderness and compassion. On some level, I've been receiving all those things. And for what it is for you this morning, it's just a heart check. How's your attitude? How you doing in unity and selflessness? Just, it's a checkup. Paul's saying, how you, how you doing? Now that you've received, just, just have a look. You're serving one another, but are you breathing it in from God? Is it going out sideways? It's not just this relationship. Come on, it's these relationships. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in this place. So God, I thank you for what you've spoken to our hearts. I thank you, God, for... I know that there are some people in the room today, God, who have felt like a spiritual outsider in this place. And today, God, not by my words, but by the power of your Spirit, you've called them to say, this atmosphere is for you. And I'm pouring out encouragement. And you're stepping, you're going to choose today, just in your heart, to take a step into the comfort of God's love and the fullness of his Spirit and his tenderness and compassion. To not sit outside anymore, but to actually believe as you grow, God says, come on, girl. Come on, my son. Step in and receive from my encouragement and love. And I thank you, God, for those of us who are in the place today and we've been setting ourselves up to, to serve you, God. And maybe we just got our eyes on us for a moment, God, and we started to maybe get a little bit tired in the race, God. Return our joy. Return our joy to receiving from you and watching it happen in other people. And now just stay with me for a moment. Maybe you're here and, and, and you'd say, yeah, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you know what it is to be far from God. And it's sin that does that, that causes the distance between us and God. But of course, Jesus came. And as we read, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? So you could be forgiven and free. And so this morning, today, you would say, you know what? I, I just know that there's got to be more than I'm seeing, living, and experiencing. And so today, I, I want you to include me into a prayer of dedicating my life choosing to follow Jesus, make him Lord of my life. The Bible says if you will do that, he will make you a brand new creation, forgive your sins, restore your purpose, and as Dalton said, change everything. So if that's you in the place this morning, you'd say, yeah, pastor, would you include me in that prayer? We, we will not center you out or embarrass you. you know, we're just, it's going to be a prayer that you pray with me from your seat. So today you're making that decision to say, yeah, I'm going to make a decision to surrender my life to Jesus to come to God either for the first time or return. Would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, include me in that prayer. Include me in that prayer today. Today is a day of decision for me. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Come on, church, let's pray with those who raised their hands in the place this morning. Just pray this from your heart if you did, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you want to pray this today. Say, dear Jesus, I lean in to receive your forgiveness and your love. And in this moment, I believe and receive new life from you. I make you the Lord of my life. I receive your encouragement, your comfort, 
your love. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name. Church, can we celebrate in this place those who just made that decision? Oh, come on, like death to life. Woo.